the weekend or something. Um, welcome to this seminar for the Berkman Institute of Bioethics. In addition to it being one of our uh, two times a month seminar, this is also one of the Hutzler Reeves um, lectures, which are uh, focused on issues in palliative care. So I, I need to do a little bit of a background just to tell everybody about um, what that means and, and the, um, the gift that makes these lectures possible. So let me let me just read a little bit to you here. The, the Hustle Reef lectures were started by a woman named Eleanor Trowbridge. And Ellie was a member of the advisory board of the Berman Institute until she passed away in 2007. She, um, at the time of her death, had made a bequest to the Berman Institute to establish what is a semi-annual lecture series. And she decided that it was important to endow that with a focus in palliative care, given the great importance that topic had to her. And we're really pleased to be able to continue the conversation in that area. Let me give you a little bit of background about um, Mrs. Trowbridge. She was born in Baltimore. Her father was a president of the family-owned S. Can Sons Company, which was a Washington area department store, a downtown landmark from 1893 to 1975, so three dates many of you in the room, I'm afraid. She graduated from Friends School of Baltimore. I have a child who did the same, so that's a good thing. She attended Vassar College and then George Washington University. She was very devoted to Johns Hopkins. In addition to serving on the advisory board for the Berman Institute, she chaired the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Council on Population and Family Growth. She also worked for many years in the development office here at Hopkins and was a development consultant for the Children's Defense Fund and Population Action International. In 1995, Ellie and her second husband, Alexander Trowbridge, established the Can Trowbridge Fund to provide a fellowship for a student at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health to support faculty research and education projects. In 2003, she received the University's Heritage Award for her outstanding service to Johns Hopkins. So we're very, very pleased to be able to continue her legacy with the Hustler Reeves Lectures, which is named after their daughter. So today, we are um, pleased to welcome, to give both the Berman Institute Seminar and a slow lecture, Harold Braswell. Harold is an assistant professor at the Albert Navy, do you say? Yeah. Yeah, close enough. Center for Healthcare Ethics at St. Louis University. He works in areas which you'll hear about today, which are at the intersection of disability studies and bioethics with a particular focus on end-of-life care. He just finished a book manuscript, which is, I guess, in, has been delivered to the press. Waiting for reviews. Well, waiting for, for reviews, reviews. So reviews, look yes. for it, hopefully, not too far off in the future. Oh. And he will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open for discussion, as we always do. The topic today, as you see, depending on the family, the crisis of freedom in U.S. hospice care. Welcome, Professor Braswell. Can you hear me in the back? All right, okay. Hi, thanks for coming out, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, first, thanks for Jeff for inviting me out here and for changing the schedule as was needed. Jeremy Green for giving him my name, and Tracy Ugamoto, who is awesome and funny and very confident. And really <laughs> okay, the title of my talk is Depending on the Family, the Crisis of Freedom in U.S. Hospice Care. Let's start with the argument. So the argument is this. The U.S. hospice system depends on familial caregiving in order to function. But familial caregivers are increasingly unable to provide the requisite level of care. As a result, there's a mismatch between the needs of patients and the capacities of their family members. This mismatch has reached a level of crisis, okay? meaning that it's systemic and systemically undermines the distribution of hospice care in this country. How does this crisis affect dying patients? We could talk about it as a health service crisis, we could talk about it as a humanitarian crisis. But what I want to argue here is that its core is an issue of freedom. That dying patients who are caught with insufficient familial support in the U.S. hospice system have their freedom limited and even negated entirely. Okay, so that's the argument I'm making. It's a crisis of freedom. 
Now, this crisis is relevant to the issue that we bioethicists, let me put my bioethicist hat here, normally talk about when we talk about freedom at the end of life, and that's assisted suicide. So it's relevant to that. Uh, but I'm going to argue that it's much bigger than the topic of assisted suicide, and that it should be more fundamental to what we do as bioethicists than the topic of assisted suicide, no matter how important we may consider that. So that's the overall argument. And I'm going to start out here by talking about the signature piece of U.S. hospice legislation, which is the Medicare hospice benefit. Uh, so Medicare hospice benefit incorporated hospice into Medicare, passed in 1982. Uh, it gave hospice a federal reimbursement structure and created a uniform definition of hospice that would apply throughout the country. So there have been hospices throughout the country doing their own thing. It created a standard definition of hospice. And when we think about hospice now, what we think about is how the Medicare hospice benefit defined hospice. So how did it do that? Well, it defined hospice as a treatment or death modality oriented towards patients who would be terminally ill, meaning they have a prognosis of six months or less to live. It also defined hospice as an interdisciplinary treatment modality. So what do I mean by interdisciplinary? I mean that it would have a medical component, a spiritual component, a psychosocial component, at times a nutritional component, and that the core uh, providers of hospice would be a team, including a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, and a chaplain. That's what I mean by interdisciplinary. But what I really want to focus here on is how the Medicare Hospice Benefit defined the location where hospice care would be delivered. The benefit established an 80 to 20 ratio between outpatient and inpatient hospice care. So that means if any hospice is census, 80% of the care would have to be delivered in an outpatient location, and only 20% would be delivered in an inpatient location. Now, the inpatient care that would be delivered would be short-term in nature, a matter of days, generally for patients who are actively dying. Okay, so that's how it redefined inpatient care. And I can talk about hospice, how hospice conceived of inpatient care earlier than that in the Q&A, if you're interested in that, but this was a shift. What this 80-20% ratio did was situate the primary location of hospice as the home. Okay, it made hospice care a primarily home-based benefit in the United States. Okay, so far so good, but we talked about interdisciplinary care earlier. It includes a lot of different things, but what's not included in interdisciplinary care in the Medicare hospice benefit? One thing that's not included is long-term care. Uh, what do I mean by long-term care? I mean assistance with what are generally considered non-medical activities of daily living. So stuff like feeding, cleaning, transportation, basic hygienic maintenance, uh, companionship, and basic safety uh, in the home context or in an institutional context. That was not included in the medical care system, for the most part. Now, dying patients do need long-term care. Uh, they have significant physical and cognitive disabilities. Uh, these disabilities escalate very rapidly. Uh, they have a very rapid loss of function. And although the escalation can be rapid, oftentimes a person is dying for a long time, okay, for a matter of months, and in this process where they're getting uh, more and more disabled. So, okay, you've got this interdisciplinary benefit without a significant long-term care component, so who provides the long-term care? Well, the long-term care is provided by the patient's primary caregiver. Uh, so this is a designated person who, in general and in theory, is providing care based on an emotional commitment rather than uh, financial reimbursement. And in hospice literature, it's almost always referred to as the patient's family member. Okay, so their family member is their long-term care in this context. Now, this dependence on familial caregiving was essential to why the Medicare hospice benefit got passed. It allowed it to build a political coalition. It appealed to conservatives okay, who wanted to save money, and by defraying the cost of hospice in part to unpaid familial caregiving, it in theory would allow uh, the U.S. healthcare system to do that. It was supported by liberals, this was the era of Reagan, they were looking for political alliances. Medicare hospice benefit was the first and only healthcare entitlement under Reagan's first term. Uh, and it was supported by hospice advocates themselves, uh, because they believed that the home was the ideal site for caregiving, and that family members should be ideal caregivers. That's a huge part of how their critique of hospital-based end-of-life care, that it took end-of-life care away from its proper site in the home and the family. So this basic arrangement 
has persisted since the Medicare Office Benefits Passage. There's been a lot of changes uh, to the conditions of part participation under Medicare, uh, but not this. It's remained basically the same. <coughs> and what I want to note before I go on is it's, it's based on a, a fundamental assumption. And it's based on the assumption that most dying Americans have families at home that are capable of caring for them. And this kind of larger, sorry, I didn't mic, macro <laughs> assumption is based on a series of many assumptions. So one, that there's going to be a stable geographical location, the home, that patients have homes. Two, that the home is itself a safe environment and is located in a neighborhood that will have a relative degree of safety that you would need to do end-of-life care. Uh, that uh, the dying individual and or their primary caregiver will have access to resources necessary to care for the dying person. So, you know, uh, food, uh, basic medicine, things like that. Uh, and the primary caregiver will have the time, the physical and mental ability, which could be very high, uh, and the emotional willingness to care for their dying relative. So all these smaller assumptions are built under the larger assumption that this is something that Americans will be able to do. And my argument is that even at the time of the Medicare House Benefits Passage in 1982, this assumption was wrong. U.S. families were, in fact, in 1982, really far removed from caring for their dying relatives. Uh, and since 1982, this, this removal and the mismatch between what's being asked of families uh, and what they can and are willing to do had widened. It's gotten worse since the Medicare House has been in this passage. So, you know, there was a time when familial caregiving for the dying was the norm in the United States. That time was up till the late 19th century and early 20th century. Okay, uh, what happened then? Well, medicine happened, okay? You had the rise of medicine and medical authority and of U.S. hospitals. Uh, and hospitals and doctors took death out of the home uh, and brought it under the purview of medicine. More people began dying in hospitals and medical providers became the primary providers of end-of-life care. Now, they didn't do a very good job at this uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and in fact, their focus was curative medicine, which was the basis of medical authority at the time, the ability to cure. And so dying patients were stigmatized and shunned, and uh, in the early 20th century, at least, uh, often kicked out of hospitals. You can read about this in Emily Abel's book, uh, The Inevitable Hour. Uh, but it was out of the home. The hospice movement, 70 years later, in the 1970s, saw this correctly, I would say, as a problem, and they wanted to correct this problem by returning death to the family. Okay, the hospice movement, it was progressive in some ways, but it was also conservative in that it argued that we're, we're moving forward, but also we're returning things to how they really should be, and that's this an idea of familial caregiving. But the problem was, by the 1970s when the hospice movement started, and certainly by the early 1980s, the family had changed in fundamental manners since the late 19th century. Well, okay, there was a time when familial caregiving was ubiquitous. What were its foundations? Well, one foundation was unpaid women's labor, okay? If you're a woman in the 19th century, your opportunities to do stuff other than care for your dying family members would be extremely limited, okay? That was understood to be women's role at the time. It was based in the South on slavery and in the North on a racist division of labor. It was based on a conception of the family as a unit bound by economic necessity where individuals were basically wedded to their biological families throughout their lives. And it was based on a very low quality of medical care. And therefore, no expectation that dying people would have adequate pain control. This is prior to the development of anesthesiology. Uh, it was really a theological conception of the good death. A good death is a death in the eyes of God. There's really not that much that we humans can do about that. You can read about that in Shia Lee's book, The Modern Art of Dying. So over the course of the 20th century, these foundations of familial caregiving would break down. And this breakdown is awesome, OK? I'm a progressive. It's basically positive in every sense. I wish we'd go farther, OK, in that direction. So very good thing. It's great. Uh, we have individual life. Conception of the individual comes into being in the 20th century, no longer defined by your biological family. We have women's rights and civil rights. And we have medical progress, which creates a higher expectation of care. Okay? If my dying family member dies in pain, I'm going to be upset about it now in a way that I wouldn't have been in 1850. My expectations are higher, and they've become professionalized. Okay? So meaning that me, as an average Joe family member, do 
do not possess that professional expertise. So it's great, it's awesome, but it left the US hospice system depending on a family that, for the most part, didn't exist. Even in 1982, US hospice leaders recognized this on some level. So here's a quotation. The and I'm sorry for people with eyes, it's a little bit small, but I'm going to read it with like great gusto. You're going to love it. Trust me. Okay. The, the proposed, it'll be better than many years. Okay. The proposed legislation, can, they're talking about the Medicare Access Benefit, contains the requirement that no patient receive more than 20% of their care days in an inpatient setting after the patient's accepted in the hospice system. So this is the 80 20 requirement, right? Uh, the experience of the Connecticut Hospice, which is the first hospice in America, it was originally called Hospice Inc., changed its name, uh, is that this requirement is unrealistic. Physicians in Connecticut have prescribed inpatient hospice care days for their patients, which comprise 50% of all care days. The mix of inpatient and home care days experienced by the same group was directed by physicians and care providers whose only consideration was the optimal care for each patient. So they're saying we didn't have political considerations, we had medical ones, and if it's a medical consideration, based on these results, we recommend a 50-50 ratio of home care to inpatient days. So rather than 80-20, they wanted 50-50 in 1982. And I got this from oh, the newsletter of the Connecticut Hospice. Yay, archival research. Uh, so even in 1982, there's a mismatch, right? But it's gotten a lot worse. It's developed into a crisis. And why? Because there have been changes internal to hospice since 1982, and also changes external to hospice in US society that have widened this gap. So let's talk about the internal ones. Medicare hospice benefit had a really profound effect. There were 40 Medicare certified hospices in 1983 approximately 3,500 today. Uh, but it didn't just allow there to be more hospices and better reimbursed ones, it changed the character of what a hospice is. The Medicare Hospice Benefit, coupled with some other reforms under the Reagan administration, created the for-profit hospice. And it shifted hospice care from a predominantly non-profit industry to a for-profit industry. I'm not saying the shift is good, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's different. Okay, for-profit hospices operate under different incentive structures than nonprofit hospices. Uh, now, they want to make a profit, okay, they have shareholders. Uh, now, that's why it's important to look at how reimbursement works under the Medicare Hospice Benefit. Now, under the Medicare Hospice Benefit, the reimbursement rate is static, okay? It's the same from beginning to end. However, hospice patients are more expensive. They require more care at the tail ends, when you just enroll them and at the end. So that means, from the perspective of profit, you're gonna get more profit if you have patients who have a lot of days in the middle, okay? So there was an epidemiological shift within hospice towards enrolling patients with longer stays. And who were these patients? They were patients with non-cancer diagnoses. Okay, so stuff like COPD, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So financial shift leading to epidemiological shift. You're with me? Okay. This is awesome. These patients need care, okay? These patients absolutely need care, it's a good thing. But it has two implications that are relevant to this talk. Longer time on service means more burden on caregivers. And this burden is felt even more harshly because hospice is still basically designed for cancer patients. The model of cancer patient in the 1970s as US hospice leaders were formulating hospice uh, dying person was a cancer patient. It was an assumption of a stable disease trajectory, there is limited memory care, and even the lack of long-term care, I would argue, is implicit in the cancer diagnosis. So you have patients who need, they can be cared for by hospice very adequately, but it's not as good a fit as a cancer patient. So the upshot of this is that familiar caregivers are asked to do more due to changes in hospice. And they're asked to do more in a context that is sparser and bleaker in some respects. So let's talk about the external changes since 1982. Uh, we witnessed the uh, rollback of the social safety net, uh, greater society reform, uh, and this has been a bipartisan effort uh, going from Reagan to Bush to Clinton to Bush. Uh, the signature example of this would be welfare, uh, which is worth less now than it was due in 1984 due to inflation, and also harder to get if you're poor than it was back then. Uh, but we could also talk about long-term care funding and other things. So that's the broader context, and this is often referred to as neoliberalism, if you want to use the jargon word. Uh, so that's kind of the context, it's a sparser context, and then you have an acute shock, okay, like the housing crisis. Um, the housing crisis is significant because it targeted the key and ideal location of hospice care in this country, which is the home, okay? 
50 million people uh, were adversely affected. I forget the age, but they lost their homes. Lost their homes uh, as a result of the housing crisis. Uh, home ownership rates are down, and it's even harder to rent. Okay, and a higher percentage of people's paychecks are coming to the rent as a result of the housing crisis. Um, so you have this kind of uh, context of declining social services, and then you have an acute and traumatic shock to the core location of hospice. Now, I'm talking about here events that are kind of big events cut across a lot of demographic categories. Okay, the rollback of social services, housing crisis impacted a lot of people. Uh, however, there are certain groups that are more adversely affected than others. As former North Carolina's Congressman Brad Miller uh, noted, the housing crisis was an extinction uh, event for the black and Latino middle class in this country. Uh, but even before the housing crisis, we had the phenomena of housing discrimination. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much at length about housing discrimination, except to say that it shaped very profoundly the geography of Baltimore and St. Louis where I live, and even Atlanta, the black mecca where I did my research profoundly shaped by housing discrimination. So it's ubiquitous. And I guess what I want to ask here is, what does it mean to have a home-based hospice system in a country that's fundamentally shaped by housing discrimination? Um, I don't have a great answer for you. That's my next project. If you want to talk to me about it, I'd love to do so. Uh, but I do have some ideas based on my observation and in research. And housing discrimination is devastating for familial caregiving. Uh, you have areas of concentrated poverty, uh, you have a lack of accessible food, uh, you have a lack of accessible transportation and often longer commute times to work, something that could very significantly affect caretaking dynamics, you have a general lack of economic resources, you have high crime rates, and on top of that you also have a phenomenon of mass incarceration, which has been devastating for African American families in this country, really breaking up rich networks of caregiving. Uh, so all of this is very bad. Okay, so due to changes both internal and external to hospice, the 1982 mismatch between hospice requirements and familial capacity is now a crisis. So we have some indicators of this crisis. Uh, I'm not a stats guy, but because I care about y'all, I did it. Uh, <laughs> so we have 12% uh, of U.S. hospices don't accept uh, patients without familial caregivers. 18% uh, of U.S. hospices, this reported in the Washington Post, did a, a number of series on this, uh, serving 50,000 people provide very little care to patients immediately before dying, so when they need the most care, leaving familiar caregivers in situations they're, that they're unprepared to deal with and that can quickly turn traumatic. Um, from 2000 to 2009, there's been a 50% increase in transitions between care sites in the last 90 days of life. So patients moving from the hospice to the nursing home, to the emergency room, et cetera, which indicates the lack of a stable caregiver. Uh, and there's been an increased use of nursing homes as sites of end-of-life care. I'm going to talk in, in greater detail, perhaps not as much as I would like about nursing homes. I love talking about nursing homes. Uh, but nursing homes are not facilities for the dying, but they're being increasingly used for end-of-life care. 20% of Americans die in nursing homes and 40% of people over the 85. So these are all kind of bigger indicators of a crisis. But I'm going to use also ethnography uh, as evidence of the crisis. So what can ethnography tell us? Uh, well, you know, doing an ethnography can tell you a lot about the circumstances that lead patients to have inadequate primary care beginning. These circumstances can be quantified. They're not resistant to quantification. But often they're, they kind of subvert our assumptions about how sociological categories work. So ethnography can be really useful for seeing how things play out. Uh, it can give us an idea of what happens to them when they do fall into this mismatch. And I, I will argue as well that they can give us a sense of how big this problem is. According to how broad are these demographic groups that what I'm talking about as the crisis refers to. So I did an ethnography. Uh, one year in Atlanta hospice care and I had two sites. Uh, one is an institution I'm going to refer to as Amberview Hospice. Uh, it's a pseudonym. Uh, it's a local branch of a major hospice corporation. So it's subjected to Medicare rules uh, and has this kind of federal structure. The other uh, is a Catholic charitable end-of-life care facility called Our Lady of Perpetual Health and Home. They let me use their real name, very nice. Uh, it's a charitable facility that cared for patients that fell into this gap, okay? So that if, if you can't really have adequate care and care in hospice and you're a social worker in Atlanta, you try to get your patients into Our Lady of Perpetual Health Home. It's kind of like a funnel. So I was able to see across hospices throughout the city and even emergency rooms, et cetera, how patients fall into this and what brings them to this place. So as you will see, there are a lot of reasons why a caregiver would be inadequate, a term that I'll qualify in a second at the end of life. 
A uh, caregiver could be aging or have significant disabilities, okay? Uh, many people dying are elderly. They are perhaps married or have friends who are also elderly. Uh, and sometimes they have friends and are married to people who are also dying, okay? And that makes caregiving very hard. You have a general lack of economic resources, social resources. You have a need to work to alleviate those resources. It's very hard to be a primary caregiver if you're working 35 to 50 hours a week. Uh, and you have familial conflict. People often hate their family members, and they continue hating them when they start dying. It's not like some magic pill. I'm like, oh, you're dying. Oh, okay, like, oh, this, uh, my whole childhood, it's better now. No, it's, it's, there's a lot of ambivalence about, just about, there's ambivalence about any of our family members, and that ambivalence, it's, it's there in the room when you're dying. Okay. That line, people love that line. I don't know, I don't want to analyze you from apart. Okay, but, uh, can I go up here, why is it not? Okay, so the point I'm making here is when I say adequate caregivers, adequate's like a really high bar, okay? Uh, I was not an adequate caregiver for my own mother, okay? It's a very high bar to me. And this is because of the social factors that I'm talking about, and it's also because of the biology of terminal illness, okay? Terminal illness is very violent, it's very scary, okay? And therefore, caring for a dying person is very, 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 very hard. Okay, in general, and this context makes it much worse. So adequate is a very high one. And I'm going to illustrate how high this bar is. We had two stories. Uh, both took place at Amberview Hospice, that kind of big uh, hospice. Okay, so let's start with Stephen. Stephen was a 54-year-old white male. Uh, he had esophageal cancer, uh, and he'd been on service for eight months. Uh, he had no family in the area. He was divorced, uh, and he had a daughter who lived in San Diego, which is across the country from the Um, uh, so he didn't, he didn't have any familial caregivers, basically, but he was on service. Uh, and he had a couple things going for him, or rather against him, that made his situation a lot more complex. He had comorbid medical conditions, which are too numerous for me to actually list here, but to be succinct, I'll say that the most salient ones are he had bipolar disorder, and he was a recovering amphetamine addict, okay? What these two more comorbidities did is that it made it very difficult for him to self-administer medication. Okay, he had to basically be his own primary caregiver, uh, but that was really hard for him. Uh, and sort of the image that I want you to have, I, I wish I had taken a picture of it when I was in the room, uh, so I could put it up here, is paper plates filled with pills. Okay, he lived in an apartment that was very small, wasn't a great place, and as soon as you walk in, all you see everywhere, okay, next to the toilet, okay, next to the sink, under the bed, on the bed, were paper plates filled with pills, very colorful pills, he was taking a diversity of pills. And that was his medication regimen, okay? He would kind of putz around his apartment during the day, couldn't really get out much, and every once in a while, he'd grab, okay? And that was how this was going, okay? So real problems in self-medication. These problems were compounded by the environment he was living in. So he was living in an apartment complex for recovering drug addicts. Um, and unfortunately, there were some people in this complex who continued to be Uh, interested in his drugs and his medications, and so there were numerous instances of medication theft. And he was an easier target here, in part because he was bipolar, and in part, you know, I don't know if it's related to that or not, he was gullible, okay? He was a gullible, trusting guy, okay? Someone would come in, a woman would come in, hey, your hair's a little bit long, let me give you a haircut. She's cutting his hair, and she could just reach around and just take pills from the various plates and put them in her pockets, okay? And this happened numerous times. Uh, On top of this, the complex is in a red-lined area, okay? It's an area that's been subject to housing discrimination. He's a white guy, okay, but he's living in a predominantly African America because he, American area, because he's lower class and because he's a recovering addict, okay? So this is how this worked. The grocery store is not an easy walking distance to his house, and there's a high crime rate. He doesn't own a car, he doesn't, and there's not great public transportation coverage in Atlanta. Uh, so what this meant is he got robbed several times going to the grocery store, And even the basic task of going would become increasingly difficult as he got more and more disabled. He'd become dependent on volunteers to do that. But, you know, volunteers are great people. I love volunteers. I was a hospice volunteer for five years. But you've got other stuff going on in your life. Volunteers are not often uh, as reliable. So we have, he's got an issue with untreated pain, uh, which it was the kind of thing that he'd always be like a nine on the pain scale, but I'm fine with it which is paradoxical to say, and there wasn't really much the hospice people could do about it, because like he's nine all the time, but that, that was his 
sort of status, and not great coordination of medicine. He had a psychiatric nonprofit uh, that was also helping him, but it was hard to coordinate those things. And at a basic level, you have problems with daily sustenance. Um, he only ate microwavable pot pies. Uh, he was terrified of choking. He had esophageal cancer, and anything but a microwavable pot pie uh, would get stuck in his throat or make him terrified of getting something stuck in his throat and choking to death. Um, so, you know, when he ran out of microwavable pot pies, it was it wasn't just oh I'm hungry. It was like a real existential fear, which it was, which was accurate in fact. <clears throat> so, we talk to you a little bit about how he died. So. Uh, Stephen um, didn't have a lot going for him at the end of life, but one, one thing he did uh, take a lot of genuine um, kind of pride in was he wanted to donate his body to science. Uh, now this had been suggested to him by the hospice social worker, uh, in part because he couldn't afford his own funeral. Uh, and a hospice social worker needs to find, okay, someone who's going to pay for the burial. And so therefore there's a certain incentive structure there that would, might lead a social worker to suggest to lower income patients who can't afford a funeral that they donate their body to science because the university pays for the funeral. Okay, this wasn't like a malicious thing, the social worker was an awesome person, I'm friends with her, but there's an incentive structure there. Uh, however, I will say that Stephen was really excited about this, okay? He had an intellectual bent, he liked the idea of contributing in the great march forward of science, okay? And he didn't want his daughter to pay the bill for his funeral. So this was something he genuinely cared about, okay? One Saturday morning he wakes up, he's got a really significant pain in his gut. I guess it would have to be off the scale, because already his pain was, in his estimation, basically off the scale. Uh, Calls the hospice, they don't get there in time, he goes to the emergency room, okay? They find the cancer spread to his stomach, okay? And they ask him if he wants a blood transfusion. He's confused, doesn't have anybody to advocate for him. He says, sure, I'll have a blood transfusion. Gets the blood transfusion, dies anyway. Well, because he had the blood transfusion, he couldn't donate his body to science. So, okay. The point I'm making here is, um, you know, when there's not a sufficient caregiver present, patients are abandoned at home. And I, I mean abandoned in a somewhat technical sense. Uh, I, I mean that patients are left in a home context that actively subverts the delivery of hospice care. Uh, they're on service, but they're basically receiving little to none of the benefits of being on service. Uh, and this is only to an extent due to the lack of a caregiver. It is due to the lack of a caregiver, but in Stephen's environment, I just want to say any caregiver would have a really hard time, because this is an environment that's very hostile to the delivery of effective end-of-life care. Okay. Well, okay, what's the alternative, right? There's got to be an alternative. Uh, the alternative is a nursing home. Okay. Uh, so in theory, this works like this. Uh, nursing home attends to the long-term care needs of patients, right? There's no family member there do the long-term care stuff. Okay, so we're gonna send them to a nursing home. Hospice provides the end-of-life care, and this care is gonna be coordinated, right? So it's basically gonna work really well. They're gonna be getting long-term care and end-of-life care. Okay, but in practice, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, nursing homes are long-term care facilities. They're often skilled facilities as well that provide medical care. And skilled nursing home care uh, and hospice care compete for the same pool of Medicare Part A money. Okay, so if you're skilling patient, Medicare pays for that, but not for hospice. If you take them off skilled care and put them on hospice, the hospice gets the money. So as a result, in the same location, you have conflicting economic incentive structures. And these conflicting incentive structures create different cultures of care, okay? You have a patient on a feeding tube in a nursing home. A hospice writer might go in there and say, yep, they're just trying to skill them to death, just trying to make money off this patient, you know, giving them totally useless care, you know, that's just how nursing homes do things. Uh, meanwhile, you take them off the feeding tube and nursing home provider will say, well, they're trying to kill them. You know, hospice people, they just want the money. Uh, they don't really know about the stuff. They're just trying to kill them. So really a lot of mistrust, which would make care difficult in the best of circumstances, when you throw in the very high staff turnover rate in the nursing home context, the very high staff turnover rate, and the general lack of, of knowledge that most nursing home providers have with palliative medicine, and there could be a certain distrust of it, it makes it very, very hard to coordinate care. And in fact, what I want to argue is it does the opposite, okay? Rather than care coming together, it effectively rips the patient from apart. You have the fragmentation of the patient. A patient pulled between two providers with conflicting incentive structures. So I'm going to talk to you about Mary Bonner, uh, who I think illustrates this. So Mary was 82 years old. She had Parkinson's and advanced dementia. Uh, her husband was also in his 80s, uh, military guy, 
you know, probably could beat me up, but yet he couldn't care for her at home anymore, okay? Uh, so she was in a nursing home but receiving hospice care. Now, she did have a very supportive family, okay? She had her husband who lived nearby, uh, and her daughter visited several times weekly. Her daughter was awesome. She was everything you would want in an advocate. She was a companion, watching movies with her mother, hanging out with her, and she was a fierce advocate for her. So this is pretty much the ideal situation, okay? You've got the long-term care, you've got the family, you've got the hospice. This doesn't happen that often, but it's the ideal situation, okay? And yet, in the hospice team meeting, uh, hospice providers reported that Mary was experiencing significant pain, okay? Well, why was she experiencing significant pain? Uh, due to restrictions in the nursing home, she was only getting Tylenol uh, at the time. Uh, hospice tried to fix this, so the medical director called, left a message with the nurse on duty, uh, saying you could give her oxycodone. Uh, no response, okay? I don't know why there was no response, but there was just not a very rapid response to that. And meanwhile, Mary's in pain, and her daughter is worried that her mother is in pain. It's not nice to see your mother in pain. Um, well, is it a place where they can split a pill? Okay, so if we do do the oxycodone, is it a place that at a basic level will be able to administer pain medication to her? Ask the hospice nurse at the team meeting. As it turns out, uh, not really. Okay, and even once they got her on the correct medication, there were repeated failures to deliver medication on schedule. Mary's daughter advocated very tirelessly for her, uh, but the nursing home staff is busy. They're overworked. Uh, they're not getting paid a lot of money. Uh, it's a very stressful life. Uh, and as a result of that, they're constantly changing. You have turnover. Uh, and the hospice staff, however beautiful they were, they're not there. They're not in the facility all the time as this is happening. So she would call them on the phone, but it was very difficult to make it work. The situation was bad, got worse. There was a pneumonia outbreak in the nursing home. Mary got pneumonia, uh, and she also had several falls, which gave her bruising and also a lot of confusion. Her arms are tearing from where the nursing home nurses pulled her. It was said at the hospice team meeting a couple weeks later. So I am focusing a lot on the nursing home. Uh, I do want to say there were also errors on the part of the hospice team. Uh, at the team meeting, it was said that Mary, Mary was described as someone who will occasionally speak a word and is completely unable to make her needs known. Uh, as someone I visited with Mary a couple times a week, I'd say that this wasn't true. Mary had dementia, okay? Yeah, sometimes you would get her and she wouldn't be very responsive, but sometimes she could be very responsive. I watched the movie Goldfinger with her. We had a great discussion about all James Bond. There was like a whole history. You know, Pierce Brosnan was really my first Bond. So she had like a whole different perspective. It was really interesting. But, she, she, but this, this got missed in the hospice team. It wasn't that the medical director was a bad person, okay? It's that she's only going out there like at most once or twice a week. Oftentimes it's nurses going instead, and she didn't have that kind. So this is what I mean the fragmentation, okay? That you should have hospice and long-term care working together, but in reality, they pull the patient apart. I mean that metaphorically, but also a little bit literally when you think about her arms tearing from how her body was moving. So, I want to kind of zoom out a little bit. Let's look at the spectrum from Stephen to Mary, okay? We've got two radically different situations. You know, it might not be surprising that a guy like Stephen falls through the cracks, okay? Is it good, is it bad? What does it say about us right now, where we are in this country? But it's not terribly surprising that a lower income guy who's bipolar and poor, you know, falls through the cracks, okay. Mary, however, okay, was not a marginal person, okay? She was in the nursing home. She had a family that advocated for her. Middle-class family had resources. She shouldn't be falling through the cracks. And yet, in spite of these radically different situations, they had the same result, okay? You have care not being delivered. And this, to me, illustrates the range of the crisis, okay? It goes from the most marginal to people who may not really be marginal at all, yet can still be subject. Okay, so what to do? What is the impact of the crisis on dying patients? I want to argue that the primary way we should think about this impact is in terms of freedom, okay? Dying patients who are subject to the crisis that I'm talking about have little or no freedom. Now, that cuts against the way we normally think of freedom in bioethics. In bioethics, we think of freedom as patient autonomy. So this is the ability of patients to make their own medical decisions, uh, and the ability of the individual to control his or her own life on a kind of macro scale. Uh, impingements of freedom 
only come within bioethics in general via paternalism or coercion. So when somebody makes a medical decision for you or forces you to make a medical decision that you don't want. Um, so in this sense, there's no problem. Okay, there's no impingement on Mary or Stephen's freedom. They made their own medical decision. Um, and as a result of that, bioethics has traditionally had nothing to say about the cases of people like that. Uh, they're considered problems of health services or health policy, which is a different thing than bioethics as it's construed. I know here you all are doing something different, really interesting, I want to hear about it, but that's often as it's talked about in bioethics literature, if it's talked about at all. So we've had 40 arguments about freedom at the end of life, okay? And really, no, no mention of like the structure of US hospice care. There's no bioethics articles in general about the Medicare hospice benefits impact on freedom at the end of life. It's about physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, removal of treatment, things like that. This is a problem. This silence is a problem. And it's a problem because of what bioethics and bioethicists like me think that we're doing, what we claim to be doing. Bioethics purports to be a field oriented around promoting autonomy, about freedom, okay? That's part of why bioethics exists. It construes itself as allied with 60s liberation movements, okay? If you read David Rothman's book, if you want to hear more about the civil rights movement, women's rights movement. But because of its silence on this issue and other issues like it, which we can talk about, I'm going to argue that it's failing to do that. It's failing at its own stated mission. And I think part of the failure is how we think about autonomy, and so I want to argue that we need to think about it a little differently. It's not just an individual's decision, the mere fact that they're making a decision. It's also a question of what options are available then to decide between, and are there any options that are genuinely liberating, or at least not completely constraining? We need to provide patients with options that provide an individual, if we're concerned about autonomy, with some degree of control over their lives. And dying patients without sufficient familial support, I'm gonna argue, don't have any control. Uh, they live in extremely constraining environments that strip them of almost full control over their lives, and in some cases, I would argue, of effectively all control over their lives. The nursing home could be described as a total institution. Atul Gawan, okay, he's not like a radical figure, describes it as such, okay, in his book. Uh, and that's for the disabled, okay? We're not even talking about the dying for the dying. It's constraint, total institution for the disabled. For the dying, it's a lot worse, because it's not even designed for the dying. Uh, and the home is a site of abandonment, leaving someone like Stephen with no control over his life. We gotta be able to identify this, to see it as a problem to begin with, to see it as something that's not just something health service people deal with, but that is bioethical, and to respond to it. Uh, and if we don't do so, I think we're, why, why like even exist? Okay, like why do we even need bioethics if it's not gonna have anything to say about this, if it's just gonna punt? Okay, what's the point? I want to talk about physician-assisted suicide. So, you know, if you're interested in asking the Q&A, I have lots of thoughts about the relevance of all this to physician-assisted suicide. I've worked on physician-assisted suicide for basically a decade. got lots of opinions that I'm not going to give. The only opinion I'm going to give is that physician-assisted suicide should not be the, prime, the only, or I would argue even the primary site with the bioethical engagement with the topic of freedom at the end of life. Okay, it shouldn't be the primary site. Instead, just basically improving the quality of end-of-life care should be. And this is in part due to practical political realities that I'm not going to talk about here, but if you are curious in the Q&A, I can give you my sense of how I see physician-assisted suicide changing in the United States in my lifetime. The answer is not a whole lot, unless there's a revolution that topples the tripartite uh, you know, system of government and the Supreme Court. Okay, unless that happens, we're pretty much where we are. More libertarian states are going to go assisted suicide. State of Missouri, where I live, never will. Okay, that's why I say it's political reality. It's not really going to change. But that's not my primary argument. My argument is that it should even philosophically be fundamental for bioethics. And so I want to go back to Stephen and Mary. So what if Stephen and Mary had had physician-assisted suicide available to them in their situations? Could we really say that that is extending their freedom at a basic level, or is the primary factor in their being freer? Is somebody in a nursing home getting horribly mistreated? You give them assisted suicide, maybe it's a way out, maybe it's good. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying it shouldn't be primary, okay? The environment they're in, 
The complete lack of control in our lives has to be what we see first and what we respond to. And to do so, you know, I, I think we kind of need to go a little meta and think about bioethics, think about what we're doing, think about what our methods are, our epistemology, what we're building, what's the point. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do that. I know uh, a bunch of you all are too uh, here at Johns Hopkins, and so I'd love to hear your feedback. Okay.
likely still threads of it. Yeah. But but I would say that we and others can disagree with me that um, for us this just sits right in justice. That if you're looking at the sort of way in which you're thinking about justice in terms of allocation and then social justice in terms of the disadvantages that are compounded by that distribution, that, that there's just a sweet spot for this. Mm -hmm. um, and But I completely hear your sort of political argument or advocational <laughs> argument, if that's a word, about how to get this to the larger community of bioethicists if you are going to cast them as autonomy lovers. God bless Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> You're a great, wonderful audience. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, how many uh, libertarian anarchists do you have in your bioethics department? How many guys in biker gangs? Okay, we have one guy in a biker gang. <laughs> Three doors down from it. Okay, and he's awesome. a libertarian. Okay, and when he, or he, or he hears justice, okay, it's like nothing. Okay, it, it's, it's, it's everything is free. So I don't know you're saying, okay, do we need to cater to the lowest common denominator? I'm saying, but you know, but, but that, I love that it sits very comfortably here, but you know, my department is Christian bioethicist, a libertarian anarchist, and me, a secular Jewish guy, I'm awesome, I'm great, but that's where I am. And you know, there, there's, there's something useful, but also I want to say, I don't think they're free. Okay, I don't think if you're in a nursing home, Okay, I, I come from disability rights. I'm from a deaf family. Okay, so I, I don't even know if anyone in a nursing home should be described as for us. It, this is going to go a little bit off the rails and it's really going to come out. But especially a dying person in this context, I find it very difficult to say they have any free, that, that, that Mary is, is able to determine any yeah. aspect of her life whatsoever. And, and I, I believe that. I, I guess maybe I just believe that. And, so. and I, there is no argument for me that that is the case, but my worry is the Sorry, my worry is focusing on it merely as, merely is not right, as autonomy and freedom right. doesn't get to the pull back from the picture and say this is an institutional crisis. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, very clearly, it is an institutional crisis, and I would rather, rather than get away from it, I would rather say that without an institutional component to our concept of autonomy, it's pseudo autonomy. Okay, and so we've got to rethink the concept so that it could be open to all of this content that is, it's excluding. So that's where, you know. Hey. Hello. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Um, so I have a question, because it seems like the concept of freedom that you are implicitly working with here is a fundamentally Marxist one, because the worry, um, the thing that makes individuals in these cases, uh, in these cases that you're describing unfree, is not the lack of the ability to choose in a medical mm -hmm. setting, and it is not only a hyper-limited uh, choice set, it's actually material circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a way in which we can say, oh, both uh, Mary and, uh, I forget, the, and Stephen, yeah. that if they both had material resources, they would be able to lift themselves outside of, of that sort of necessitating, uh, terrible situation. So I'm just wondering, to what degree you're making a, an analysis that is medicine specific mm -hmm. and not just a an argument about the way in which economic relations under capitalism mm -hmm. ultimately are a danger to freedom in this Marxist yeah. sense. Uh, and this is just one way in which we see that. So it, it, it made me think about this because of your conversation about what would be required, for example, yeah. to yeah. Um, overcome uh, the legal obstacles to physician-assisted suicide, and then yeah. I think about what would be required to overcome the real causal factors in these cases, and that seems to be an overhaul of economic relations. It's a it's a problem of poverty. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, Mary's not well. Right well, poverty understood as not being high class. It's yeah, middle class. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, you know, I I would say I. I've seen some people who are even in upper middle class families who, who I, I would argue fall under this. So it, it's not just a class thing. I'm gonna, you know, I, I'd love to make like an awesome critique of capitalism right now so much, but I'm gonna punt a little bit. Because I'm gonna say that, yes, 
that, that's an element. There's, you know, and, and if you want to make it, if someone else wants to make it and say that there, that's for the economists, okay, to debate about, you know, whether, whether this is capitalism or, you know, you could also, you could make a libertarian economic argument about this, right? You could say the nursing home lobby, okay, they get their money from the government, so this is big government that's allowed for the creation of these horrible institutions that basically, you know, whatever, so that's what, this is, if you hang out with a libertarian anarchist once a week in faculty, you, you get good at this. So, you know, I, I, I'm going to punt to some extent on that, but I just kind of want us to talk about it. I would love it that we have Marxist economic theory and libertarian economic theory in the conversation here about freedom in bioethics in some sense, because I think it's, a, it's an important uh, question. Now, what do you say, in terms of is it just material circumstances or not, that's a great starting place. I don't know if that's an end place, but that's a great starting place and it would help a lot. Uh, and so, so that's, that's kind of where I am right now. Uh, there, there could be other things as well, but that would definitely help. Hi. Yes, oh, sorry. Bronnie Cooper, the, um, the Cancer Center chaplain. I was curious when you said earlier that you were not uh, an adequate caregiver mm -hmm. for your dying mother. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, judge how would you have been adequate? Well, if I had somehow, uh, you know, managed to, uh, I don't know if I want to say to port or, or eradicate everyone else in my family, my life would have been a lot easier. Because most of the time when my mother was dying, I was fighting with my father, I was fighting with my aunt. Uh, and I was fighting with everyone around her. And so, you know, in, in my case, the guy who wasn't giving my mother her medicine, uh, you know, my, my mother, I was with my grandmother, actually, this like old Jewish woman, like never would take antidepressants like in her life. I got her to take antidepressants at the very end, and that was a fight, okay, that was like really hard. And the psychiatrist was like, oh yeah, sure, look, there's great studies on antidepressants and it could be really beneficial. You know, without telling me, my father, so my grandfather, stopped giving it you know, to her, and, and that's just one example, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't use the walker, uh, you know, so she, she fell several times, they go to the same diner in Long Island all the time, and he just leave her out there, he parked the car, and, you know, he's like obsessed with getting to the parking spot, but, uh, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, the breaking point was when I was sitting in my kitchen in my childhood home, and my mother took a, a baby wipe with feces on it, okay, and put it in the kitchen trash. And I was teaching public health, so John Snow, everyone, and I said, that's it. We're calling social services. I'm done. And I didn't end up calling social services because my aunt, who allied with me strategically until I later sued her, but one, uh, in the end, <laughs> always, always sue your family. That's going to be the take <laughs> um, You know, so, you know, it sucked. It sucked. It, the situation sucked. And, I'm not sure what I could have done with it, but I know that it wasn't good. She didn't really get on hospice till a day or two before she died. Anyway, and when she did die, it was a terrible thing. But, okay. What a terrible way to end, unfortunately. <laughs> well, but I won the lawsuit. Okay, so that's a happy ending. And, 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 yeah. We're there. Um, please join me in thanking Harold for the very good <laughs> Next um, seminar will be on March 13th. In this room again, it will be Lisa Lehman, who the Harvard and the VA National Center. We'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you very much for your